I promise I'm not gonna put this in the title because it's clickbaity and annoying, but I have officially taken my personal SIM out of this and switched to this, the 13 Pro Max. I've done it, I've gone to the dark side. The thing is, I always carried an iPhone 12 Pro Max around with me, and as you can see, I've taken very good care of it. Uh, this was actually from accidentally dropping an iPad on it, don't ask, but I haven't fully switched to an iPhone for a few years. But with a 120Hz screen, finally, on an iPhone, as well as longer battery life and a whole host of camera upgrades, this is a proper step up, even if it does feel a bit like a 12S Max rather than a 13, but historically, the S models have always been the one to get. It's where Apple refines and perfects the formula. So is this actually worth the upgrade? Are these new features genuinely worth having or just a bit, well, gimmicky? Also, is now a good time to jump ship from Android? And if you are tempted to buy an iPhone 13, is the Pro Max worth paying top dollar for? And actually, I'm not sure if you're able to tell, but this entire video so far and for the rest of it, is being shot on the iPhone 13. This is the new cinematic mode, which we'll dive into in a second, but hopefully you get an idea of how it looks. What do you reckon? Okay, so really there's three big upgrades with the new Pro and Pro Max, which by the way are exactly the same this year. There's no exclusive features on the Pro Max. It just comes down to which size you prefer, 6.1 or 6.7, and if you want a very good or exceptional battery life. In fact, in a very un-Apple-like move, these 13s are actually a little bit thicker, but they have squeezed in a bigger battery and combined with a more efficient A15 chip and also the dynamic refresh rate we get as a result of the new LTPO panel, battery life is ridiculously good. I would go as far as to say that this has the best battery on any mainstream phone. To give you an idea, I've been using both the Pro and the Pro Max as similarly as possible this week, and on average, by the end of a normal day around 10.45, 11 p.m., I still have a good 40% left on the Pro Max and about 28% on the Pro, which is still very impressive, but this Pro Max is just in another league. We're talking 10 hours of screen on time, and so two full days of regular use is easily achievable. It's the only phone I've ever properly used where I don't have any battery anxiety at all. And in a quick side-by-side -side test with the 11 Pro Max and the 12 Pro Max, after three hours of YouTube, gaming, social media benchmarks, we're down to 70, 67, and 73% respectively. But I would suggest giving my good friend Arun's video a watch as he's posted a great battery rundown test with all the latest iPhones, and I will leave a link below. So hats off to Apple. They made a slightly thinner phone, and with the A15 chip, they kind of prioritized efficiency over ridiculous gains in performance, which perhaps we don't need, although we'll come to the fact that it is still quite a bit faster. And as a result, we have two of the longest lasting phones you can buy. Now, if they could just turn their attention to faster charging, because while we do have the MagSafe ecosystem for pretty quick wireless charging, in terms of the wired lightning port, it's 20 watts. Uh, and even then you have to buy the charger yourself for the privilege of charging it at a fairly slow pace. Coming from an Android phone, pretty much any modern Android phone, it does feel painfully slow to charge. Let's talk about this screen, because it's 200 nits brighter than before, now up to 1000 nits, and it is noticeably brighter than the 800 nits we get on last year's iPhones and also on the new 13 and 13 mini. The notch is 20% smaller, but only horizontally, and they don't even utilize that extra space right now. Uh, there's still no battery indicator, so that's not really a big upgrade. But the big one is ProMotion. We finally get an adaptive 120Hz refresh rate on an iPhone. And from the moment you turn it on for the first time, you definitely notice how much smoother everything is. I must admit, it is partly why I didn't end up switching to the 12 Pro Max <laughs> back of this thing, it's so sad, um, because coming from an Android phone with a high refresh screen, on an iPhone that's 60 hertz with these pretty long animation times, it did feel a bit sluggish to me. So while this may not be a huge deal for the average Joe buying an iPhone, if you are a bit more of a techie, then you will definitely appreciate this 120 hertz. But if you're not a fan, for whatever reason, in the accessibility settings, you can turn it off and limit it to 60 hertz, but crucially, it is still dynamic, so you're getting 10 to 60 rather than 10 to 120 hertz. The only downside is there aren't really any games that properly support 120 hertz right now on iPhone, because while the iPad Pro has a few dozen, Tactical, for example, it's still 60 hertz on the iPhone, but hopefully in a few months as developers update their games, we'll have a few more to play with. 
Now powering everything, we have the new A15 Bionic chip, uh, along with six gigs of RAM. And in all models of the 13, it is a six core CPU, but only in the Pro and Pro Max do we get the slightly beefier five core GPU versus four cores on the 13 and 13 mini, which does seem to make a difference in benchmarks actually, and will no doubt come in handy when games do start supporting 120 and are more demanding. But if we then bring in the 11 and 12 Pro Max, you can see a pretty significant uptick in graphics performance even over just the last couple of years. What's interesting though is that a lot of people will then think, well, what's the point of the A15? Do I really need that extra performance when, you know, these still play everything flawlessly? Well, that's kind of the point, the longevity of it, because you know that getting the latest iPhone, in this case with the A15, will comfortably last you three, four, five years from now, which is not something you can say about the Android competition you've got that future-proofing built in. So not only is this the longest lasting phone you can buy in terms of battery life, it is also the most powerful. But does it have the best camera? Well, while it is very subjective and you don't have as many options as some Android rivals, as a whole, photos, selfies, videos, the UI, I would say, yeah, this is the best. I can't wait to see what Google does with the Pixel 6 and 6 Pro. Definitely make sure you've subscribed as I'll be doing a big comparison uh, between this, the S21 Ultra and the Pixel. But while I don't necessarily agree with Apple that this is the biggest leap ever for the cameras on an iPhone, it's certainly a step up with bigger sensors and wider apertures across the board and also a couple of very interesting new features. And these photography styles are a definite highlight and you get five different style options. Now these aren't filters that just holistically apply over the whole image. Apple's semantic rendering, as they call it, makes specific adjustments so you still have natural skin tones. But it does give you a lot more flexibility to make your iPhone photos look more like something you'd get from maybe a Samsung or Google phone with rich contrast and cool options. And then you can go further, adjusting each style's tone and warmth, which gives it a new name. I did ask Apple if this would be coming to the 12 series, but they wouldn't say. It is very cool though, and it works with both front and back cameras and all three lenses. Speaking of lenses, the telephoto is now a three times optical zoom, up from 2.5 on the 12 Pro Max, and it's fantastic for portraits. But for longer zooms, well, it can't compete with the periscope lens on the S21 Ultra, which has genuinely usable shots up to 30 times. Although somehow, Apple is the only one who can make the transition between lenses this smooth. The S21 and frankly all Android phones always feel laggy when switching between them. The ultra wide lens now has a f1.8 aperture versus 2.4 last year and also now has autofocus pixels so it doubles as a macro lens which means you can get up to two centimeters from your subject for some fascinating or creepy or just bizarre looking shots. And then of course we have the LiDAR sensor, although Apple didn't mention this once during their launch event, so nothing really new here, but it does continue to come in handy, although pretty much just for the more accurate measuring. The biggest surprise though, aside from that incredible battery life, is that this cinematic mode actually works really well. I didn't think it would. So on a basic level, you get a nice bokeh effect so your subject stands out, but then you can also adjust the aperture as well to make it more or less intense, which I would tinker with because by default, I find it a bit too strong and artificial looking, so I would tone it down a bit. But crucially, you can change the intensity and also the focal point of the video before, during, and after you shoot it. And also, if you think afterwards, uh, I don't really like that, you can fully turn off cinematic mode on a video you've already shot. And as for automatically racking focus between subjects based on face detection and the scene, it actually works. Not flawlessly, but much better than I expected. And it uses the depth disparity between the multiple lenses and also a bit of machine learning to figure out when to change focus. But then when it comes to editing, you can only change the focus and aperture in iMovie, plus it seems to record in HDR, hybrid log gamma specifically, which makes it a little bit trickier to edit with. Although in Final Cut Pro, you can convert it from Rec 2020 to Rec 709, which then you can export and use normally. However, there are a couple of compromises because right now it is limited to 1080p30, although that's not really a problem if you're just using it for TikTok or something. And also you can't switch lenses once you start filming. To be fair, you may actually never want to use cinematic mode. If not, well, the 13 Pro Max still shoots the best video on a phone in terms of overall quality and stabilization, particularly with that sensor shift OIS that now all iPhone 13s get. 
But we do also have ProRes video to look forward to. It's not available right now, it's coming soon. Uh, but one thing to bear in mind is only the Pro models will get that and also not the base 128 gig storage because apparently shooting in ProRes on this will use about six gigs of storage per minute. So you'll have to get the 256, 512 or one terabyte versions of this to eventually get that ProRes support. But what about low light shots? Well, if we bring in the 12 Pro Max again for comparison, I would have thought this is where we'd see the biggest improvement. But actually, with these first few examples, they're pretty indistinguishable. However, switching to the ultra wide lens, we do start to see more of a difference. It's a little bit sharper and less noisy. And it's the same again here. In fact, just look how noisy that sky is on the 12 Pro Max. Plus the castle is just a little bit more evenly exposed on the 13. And actually, if we punch up the exposure on both, you can see just how much cleaner and more detailed the 13 shot is. So the ultra wide is significantly better. And there's also a marked improvement with the telephoto as well. You do have to look closely, but the 13 Pro Max retains a lot more of that fine detail. Switching back to the main lens, and the 13 is noticeably brighter here, and there's also a more natural color tone across the whole photo. The 13 is a touch noisier, but there's also a lot more detail here. Low light video does seem to be broadly similar between them. The 13 Pro Max has maybe slightly fewer artifacts and less noise, but there's not much in it. And annoyingly, they both still suffer from that lens flare, which darts around when there's a strong light source. So we're not really seeing much improvement to low light video. And I think the only other slightly disappointing aspect of the camera is the front selfie is basically the same as before. There's no changes aside from perhaps some minor improvements with the new ISP on the A15 chip. It is still very good. And again, particularly for video, but it can look a bit soft and lacking in detail sometimes. This is turning out to be a long video. Hopefully you're still with me, uh, but just quickly, I've got a few thoughts on my transition from, I was gonna say I'm transitioning, but that sounds kind of dodgy, <laughs> my switching from Android and the S21 Ultra to the iPhone. There's a few good things and a few bad things. Firstly, this is surprisingly big and bulky. It's wider than the S21 Ultra, and once you put a case on it, it really is a bit of a chunky monkey. The regular 13 Pro is a lot more comfortable, and I kind of wish the 13 Pro Max was just a little bit smaller. I do also kind of miss having a fingerprint reader because while the true depth face ID we get with this, I would say is the best face unlocking on any phone, when you're wearing a mask and just sometimes, I kind of wish I still had a fingerprint reader uh, like you do on the S21. Also, as much as I do love iOS, the lack of a proper split screen mode for multitasking, especially on a phone this big, seems like a real missed opportunity. I mean, iPads have it. Why can't I have it on the Pro Max as well? And I also do miss the customization of Android, like being able to speed up animations, add launchers, or really customize my home screen. But on the more positive side, the speakers are incredible. I love the little alert slider, which really is only an option on the OnePlus phones. But the biggest selling point of an iPhone is of course that ecosystem. iCloud, AirDrop, iMessage, FaceTime, and even other hardware like the Apple Watch and AirPods. For most people, this is the biggest reason they wouldn't switch to Android. Honestly, I don't think one is better than the other. I think they both have their strengths and their weaknesses. But the hardware of the 13 Pro Max in terms of offering the best performance, the best battery, and arguably the best all-round camera, and I've just realized I'm holding the wrong one. This is the 12 Pro Max. Goes to show how similar they look. The battery, the performance, and the camera. As a package, I think makes this 13 Pro Max the best phone you can buy right now, which you would hope it might be given that it costs 1,100 pounds. All I need now is a USB-C port, perhaps a slightly better selfie camera, faster charging, and maybe cinematic mode in 4K. However, while this is gonna be my new everyday phone, and I think it's fantastic, if my friends or family asked which iPhone should they buy, I wouldn't recommend the 13 Pro Max to most of them. I would say get the 13 Pro. It's hundred pounds cheaper. It's a lot more comfortable to hold. You really do appreciate that smaller size. And also while the battery life isn't quite to the same level, it's still very good and a step up from last year's. So for most of you guys, I would recommend getting the 13 Pro. But what do you reckon? Are you gonna upgrade to a 13? And if so, which one? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and don't forget, of course, this entire video was shot on the iPhone 13 between the video and the cinematic mode. So let us know what you think of the quality, excuse me, pigeon, in the comments below. And also whether my uh, cameraman James maybe is out of a job because all I need now is a phone. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed the video. And I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Chat.